Hi, so welcome back to Real Auto Reports. Right here at Real Auto Ranch, I'm Jonathan McGruin. This is another Real Auto Talk where we talk about all things automotive and uh, cars, trucks, SUVs, whether you should buy something, whether you shouldn't, some tips, tricks, all of those things. And you know, the thing that was on my mind, you might notice that we're sitting in a BMW and this is a BMW 3 Series. Well, actually, it is an M3, and this is quite the car, and we uh, we really just have started to look at it. And so this review on the car will come later down the road, but it got me thinking. We've seen a lot of really fast cars over the years, and we've driven things like the Audi R8, the, the V10 GT, we've driven the Stingray Corvette now, that, and I mean, we just saw the magazine articles from Car and Driver on the Z06. We've driven things like the M6 from BMW. That's the secure orange one on our YouTube channel. So you can look at that review. We've driven the 650i as well, which is also a very quick car. And, you know, I think about all of these cars that have super amounts of power. And there's something that I kind of was thinking about while tooling around in this M3 just recently when uh, we first drive out, you know, trying to get your first impressions on it. And one of the questions I had for people is, is there such a thing as an undrivable car, as a car that you just wouldn't want to drive regularly? Maybe it's a, a showpiece, maybe it's a car that you've always wanted, but it isn't a car you would enjoy driving regularly. And I think there's something to be said about that when you don't own multiple cars. So when I think about this BMW M3 and the M6s that I've driven and the, I guess, you know, I would go with like the Dodge Viper and the really top end Corvettes and Ferraris and McLarens and those type of cars, you know, the cars that Obviously, you have to have a lot of money to own anyway. An M6, well, the one that we tested was well over $115,000. And that goes right along with the really top-end sports cars like the, the X-Type from Jaguar. That car is incredible and lots of technology. In fact, it even has uh, switchable sport exhaust, you know, and... How many cars do you know that actually have a button on the dash that you can switch the sport exhaust on and off right there? I mean, the new Stingray has that same kind of thing where you put it into track mode and it opens the butterfly valves on the exhaust. You can see that in our reviews. And I just, you know, I think of the cars that have this much power and the one thing that comes to mind is is the streetability and how they drive on a daily basis. One thing I noticed when I drove that M6 for about a week is that it was actually kind of difficult not to A, speed, but B, to get a good rhythm with the car and drive in, in, in traffic. It was a car that really had a lot of power, so if you dumbed it down by putting it in the efficient mode and in the in the lower shift setting so it didn't hold the gear as long but then you find that you get this real flat kind of acceleration and then when the computer thinks oh you really did mean you want to go it kind of jerks you around the m's are very aggressive cars like the mercedes amgs if you've driven a cls amg or a sl amg so the sl AMGs are, are just super fast and aggressive. The AMG package on the Mercedes is incredible. But when I think about driving them every day, I guess the reason you don't see high volumes in this car is because it doesn't actually appeal to a large number of people. The WRX from Subaru is, is one of those as well. We'll be having reviews on it coming up very soon in two, for the 2015 year as we cross into the new year here at Real Auto Reports. And one of the things you look at when you're driving a car is how comfortable is it, how easy is it to drive, how, how much pleasure do you get out of it. And so I'll draw a, draw a comparison for you. We drove the BMW 335i for the 2013 model year and I love that car it was fast the twin turbo 
it had good room the four doors even in the in the newer bmws that we've driven the 435i and uh we've driven the m235i the vehicles that i've driven that are more normal to the model family or, or rather sell in higher volumes seem to be more pleasant to drive. I drove the 650i and then later had the M6 about six months, eight months later. And the thing that I noticed about that M6 was that at the end of the drive, I really preferred the 650. And I preferred it for a number of reasons. A, it still had a really nice exhaust note. In fact, we thought it might actually have a better exhaust note than the M6. Now, I know BMW fans are screaming at their at their, you know, computers right now, but what I'm getting at is that 650 was smooth and silky and fast. In fact, it's not that much slower than an M6. It didn't have that bling and flash the same way that an M6 does with the carbon fiber roof and the accent pieces and that bright orange metallic color. We had the pearl white in the 650. But I still found that the 650 offered some things that the M6 didn't. It offered daily drivability where you were comfortable driving in traffic and driving in inclement weather, the rain even, or snow, because it had the X-Drive all-wheel drive on it as well. You still had that feeling like you could blow the doors off most cars that you were sitting at the light with, yet you didn't feel like if you went to a track, you would be missing anything. It, it wasn't a car, the 650i wasn't a car that left you wanting something. If you'd never driven an M6, you probably would still look at the M6 and the the flared body and, and all the carbon fiber and the, the all of that and say, oh, well, that might be kind of cool. But on the 650i we had, we had the M Sport package. And that M Sport package made that 650i inside. It had the M wheel, the M seats, the M wheels on the outside, the rims. And so it was a vehicle that made it difficult to want to drive something that had so much horsepower and was only rear-wheel drive that when you got on it, even in efficient mode and in the more comfort settings, it still let go of the rear end in the M6. So what I'm getting at is, would I own an M6 or an AMG Mercedes a McLaren, a Ferrari, a Dodge Viper? Sure, you bet I would. In fact, that there's no secret that uh, in our family, we've been drooling over the Dodge Charger, the new Hellcat with the 707 horsepower. Incredible amount of power coming out of a car. And I think the beauty of where we've gotten to with cars again you know from the detuning era of the 70s when we watched cars like the gto and the oldsmobile 442 and the hearst olds of that of that period and and things like the cadillac eldorados like my 72 that i have out in the real auto ranch garage that kept getting detuned so from 1970 to 1971 we lost horsepower and then to 72, it kind of stayed steady, but then in 73, we lost more horsepower. And into 77, when 1972, an Eldorado had well over 300 horsepower. And then in 1977, that same Eldorado, with a very similar big block motor, now wasn't a 500, but was a 425 with barely 200 horsepower. And yes, the calculations have changed over time. And what I'm getting at is it's nice to see us as as car lovers, whether you're buying a German car or an American car like the Hellcat or, you know, a, a Italian car like a Ferrari. It's nice to see us ex exceeding the performance that that in, in challenging that performance barrier. But the funny thing is, is that vehicles like the Miata and classic vehicles like 
the MGB and the Austin Healy's, they almost another new one that we are just posting the review to is the Subaru BRZ. And previously we looked at the Scion FRS. For those of you who might have seen the BRZ blip once or twice, we had to make a few changes because, well, sometimes in our haste in reviewing a car, we, uh, especially this time of year with the model year shifts, we get to, we have to really pay attention and you, our fans, you out there, our car lovers, keep us honest. So make sure you make comments and we'll always try to correct anything we get wrong. But the BRZ, going back to my point, the FRS, those are incredible hot coupes that are affordable and almost more fun in a way than a vehicle like this M6. In a way, vehicles that have this kind of air to them, this kind of twin turbo M power and torque for days, are cars that have almost become gone out of the reach of the everyday person because of the expense and the technology. And well, it's no secret that we actually had to look at the manual to figure out how to put this M into park because there is no park. And on normal BMWs, like the 3 Series, the 335i or the 435i, you've got a nice little button up here that you press on the shifter and it puts it in park. But in the M, you've got to rely on unbuckling the seat belt and opening the door and turning it off or just turning it off to put it in park. There's no easy way to put it in park. And uh, that's kind of interesting to me because it speaks to really what this car is all about. This could be an incredible track car right off the factory show, off the factory line or off the show floor is what I was trying to say. And whereas the FRS or the Subaru BRZ, or as I said, you know, things like the Mazda Miata and boy, we are looking forward to finally seeing in person the new redesign of the Mazda Miata. Longtime Miata fans here in my family, so we, we're not sure if we're going to like it or not. But those are the type of cars that just, they're obtainable and they ride like they're on rails. I mean, they, they take the curves and they've been engineered for that fun, exciting ride. But no, they don't do 0 to 60 in 4 seconds or 3.8 eight seconds or or faster they do zero to 60 and six or six and a half or seven and you know what's funny about that is zero to 60 only really matters in a drag race when you're out on the curves the fun the smile that gets plastered on your face is taking the curve and and the excitement and the wind and the sound of the motor and the shift, the manual shift even, and you can get a manual shift in this M, but we have the automatic, but the paddle shifters give you that similar experience in a way. So I challenge you when you lust after really high performance cars, if you ever get a chance to drive one, someone says, hey, would you like to take it around the block? You know, be ginger with it at first, but kind of take it all in because it might surprise you how much of an acquired taste a high power supercar is to you or to the general population and you might be surprised that this might be a car you'd only want to drive every now and then on a really nice day where you could really get out on a dry road and enjoy it as opposed to sitting in traffic every day bumper to bumper with this massively powerful M power being strangled because you're sitting with four feet in front of you to the next car. So anyway, I just thought it was an interesting thought. And as auto lovers, this is a, being able to drive these kind of cars is amazing. BMW has so much technology and so much just innovation that they put into these vehicles to make them run and go but i think of them like driving a 427 cobra you know carol shelby never made that car to be driven every day he made it 
to win races, like the 289 Cobras that raced at Le Mans, and then the Ford GT, which they now do newer Ford GTs, right? The GT40 won Le Mans and knocked Ferrari off the pedestal. Those are the those those were the pedigrees of of, of race cars. And, and we find them in vehicles now that you can buy off the showroom floor that carry amazing amounts of performance and technology. Yet, the question is, how much would you really want to own one? And uh, would you enjoy it on a regular basis? Or would a more obtainable car that still has really good looks and technology, but is more drivable on a daily basis, be more fun? I'll let you decide. I know what we've decided here at Real Auto Port Reports with our nine cars, two of them MGBs and uh, a 72 Cadillac and a 67 Mustang, and you've all seen our 2013 Dodge Charger RT with 370 horsepower, but all-wheel drive for the winters here in Colorado. So leave your comments. Tell us what you think. And if you have questions for the next Real Auto Talk, make sure you Hashtag Real Auto Talk on our Facebook or Twitter or leave us questions in the comments to this video and we'll pick them up for the next one or at least we'll try to. I'm Jonathan McGrew. This is Real Auto Talk with Real Auto Reports and we'll see you down the road.